Okay, in this lecture we're going to be talking about system norms, the sizes of systems. So we've talked about norms of math objects, we've talked about norms of vectors, we've talked about norms of functions or signals. Now we're talking about system norms. So given the system G with transfer function G and impulse response G, so notice I use the different um, character style to indicate the different things. So the system is, is called G. It has a transfer function and an impulse response. So we define the transfer function one norm this way. We saw this transfer function one norm when we looked at the BIBO stability question. And so we get this bound. The infinity norm of the output is less than or equal to the one norm of the system times the uh, infinity norm of the input. So this is the this is the bound that we got when we looked at the system one norm. And this is this is what determines stability. We apply a bounded input, then if our system has finite one norm, then I get this inequality. The output is bounded, and it's bounded by this quantity. So that's where the BIBO stability comes in. I can apply a bounded input and the output will be bounded and this is the bound. So we can talk in general about an operator norm. Okay, so here is the, an induced system norm. So in this case, the induced norm, notice is of the system G, it's not of the transfer function, it's of the system G. The, so the infinity norm for a system is the largest, the supremum, over all u finite uh, magnitude, finite amplitude, um, non-zero of this ratio. So this is again a worst case type of norm definition. So g is operating on u. I look at the infinity norm of that. So this is so I apply this input to my system, and it's bounded. Okay, it's bounded and in magnitude. I look at the output and I look at the output magnitude over all time. I look at the ratio of these two over all bounded um, signals. And so this is the definition. So this is the induced norm of the system G. And we have gone through and shown basically that the um, system infinity norm is actually the transfer function one norm. Okay, so that's why we make a distinction between the system and its transfer function representation. Okay, so the, the system infinity norm is the transfer function one norm. So it's you, you, you need to keep track of what it, what is it you're talking about. Okay, so the system response then is the response of our input over all time to our to our system. The system one norm we saw is given by this expression. And we saw that the system is BIBO stable if and only if the one norm of the transfer function is finite. So notice it's, this is the one norm of the transfer function g, but it's written in terms of the impulse response little g. So we have that. Now, in terms of state space response, given the state space system, x dot is equal to ax plus bu, y is equal to cx plus du, we have this transfer function, and we have, we take the inverse Laplace transform of this, we get this expression. Notice we get a delta function because the inverse Laplace transform of a constant is just a delta function. And so we have this expression. So that's the impulse response. So the system is BIBO stable if and only if all the poles of G of S lie in the open left half plane, not on the imaginary axis, strictly in the open left half plane. Okay. If the matrix A has all its eigenvalues in the open left half plane, then the system is BIBO. That is, if it's asymptotically stable, then it will be BIBO stable. Having all the poles of G of S lie in the open half, left half plane does not guarantee that A is Hurwitz or that the system is asymptotically stable. Marginal stability, that is stability in the sense of Lyapunov, does not imply the system is BIBO stable. Does not guarantee that. 
We can also uh, talk a little bit about nonlinear or time varying systems. In general, we can't say a whole lot. For example, here's a system, and this is the definition y of t, which is the operator on u, is just u at time zero. So it's the constant value, but it's u at time zero. This is infinity stable, but it's not too stable. So we'll talk, uh, we talked a little bit about p stability. It's, this is not p-stable. Similarly, we have this transfer function. It, this is linear time invariant and asymptotically stable when unforced. That is, if we have no input, then, it, then the remainder is linear time invariant. When it's forced, however, it's unstable if u is a step input, a constant value 1. So in that case, it's bounded. The input is bounded, and the system is asymptotically, kind of asymptotically stable when unforced, but because of this state-dependent function on the input, um, I can get an unbounded output. So you can get all kinds of weird things happening when you work with nonlinear systems. All right, so fifth, theorem 15.3 basically says if the, the uh, impulse response one norm is less than infinity and u is in the Banach space LP, then y is in the Banach space LP, and we have this bound. So this, this shows us that the one norm on little g can actually be used as an upper bound for yp in this expression. This does not mean that, that the one norm is the induced norm for, for uh, things in LP, for, for in signals in LP. It doesn't mean that. It just means that this is an upper bound. In general, it will be conservative. That is, it will not be a tight upper bound. All right. So now we can talk about induced norms. And we're going to talk more about that in a little bit. But for now, we can talk about the induced norm. So the p-induced norm is the supremum over all non-zero inputs of the p-norm of the input times the transfer function p norm output. So this is that the, the p norm of the output over the p norm of the input. And we saw the system is p stable if and only if this norm is finite. And in fact, it satisfies this inequality where we have one norm here. We've just shown that already. So the one norm acts as an upper bound on the this induced norm. So if we look at the infinity induced norm, we have this quantity or in the, in the discrete time, we have this quantity. And so we have, we have that, the induced norm on L infinity, that is on bounded input signals. Now, what about L2? Well, in general, this quantity will be finite if and only if the system is Bible stable. Okay, And the induced norm happens to be this quantity. So notice that this quantity is actually um, a quantity that is in, derived from the frequency domain. So it's the supremum over all omega of the largest singular value of the transfer function evaluated at j omega. Okay, so, so here omega is a real value. And so this quantity defined here actually has a name. It's called the H infinity norm. So we, we throw these different terms around and it, it, it it's not, <laughs> this infinity norm is not the in H, uh, the infinity induced norm. This is this quantity. This quantity is this. Okay, so we need to keep track of what's, what's being described here. So if you look at the output, Z of S is equal to H of S times W of S, and define gamma to be this quantity. To, sh to show uh, the induced norm, um, we would actually need to show this quantity in the time domain or in the frequency domain, we have this inequality. Z, z norm squared is less than or equal to gamma squared, the two norm of W squared, as long as W is a finite energy. Okay, so I go through the proof. You can see that in the proofs. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna reserve this for the proofs and I'm going to move on. Now, if we look at the induced two norm, L2 norm, in discrete time, so for discrete time systems, 
the two induced norm is can be shown to be given by this expression instead of the uh, the supremum over all omega omega being uh, from minus infinity to infinity we can actually restrict our attention because omega appears in the um, exponent here that this exponent basically um, has unique values only between pi and minus pi so we can drop the soup and use the max and we can restrict our attention to minus pi to pi and so we have the largest singular value or basically the two norm of the transfer function evaluated on the unit circle is actually what this is talking about here so this is the this is the induced l2 norm for the um, for the system for the transfer function h so if we assume the state model given here so m uh, m inputs p outputs n states here's our transfer function notice that it's in this case it's strictly proper the um, l infinity induced norm we saw was given by this expression the l2 induced norm was given by this expression okay and it's important to ask the question how do we actually compute these quantities for example how would i compute this how would i compute this well for the l infinity induced norm this quantity there's in general no straightforward way to compute this okay there's not a, there's not a nice handy way and for, for example if you're given the transfer function getting h i j of t involves taking an inverse laplace transform then we have to compute this integral over all time actually we have to take the absolute value and then take the integral over all time this can get really complicated because it, we can be switching signs and so we have to keep track of those sign switches and so this can be really complicated in general to compute so in general there is no straightforward way to compute it but generally we also we don't need to compute it that is we only need to know if the transfer function has poles outside the stability region for Bible stability so in, in general that's that's where we're at with this so in terms of system induced norms this is this is a, a very general one very important one and if we could if we could find a way of computing it that'd be awesome you could it's not that difficult to compute numerically but um, it, it is fairly uh, exhaustive to do so but th that is one way to do it you can simulate the system um, and then do this calculation so in other words take the impulse response by simulation and then do this calculation um, out to a certain point where it is com where the system is settled basically to zero just compute the integral over that and then you have an approximation of this quantity so that's that's the uh, basic basic idea behind a system induced norm we're going to talk next more in detail about the l2 induced norm which is a very important